joining us. It's Monday, November 7. I'm on London South Bank and this is the front page. It's been another breathless week of racing action culminating in a 10 hour epic on ITV Racing at the weekend and that incredible Breeders' Cup Classic win by Flightline after which he was breathlessly compared to Secretariat and promptly retired. We'll be covering that story and all the other big topics from another uh, busy week of racing. And I'm delighted to be joined in the studio by John Harding. Welcome, John. Good morning. And via the magic of video link, uh, Peter Scargill. Hi, Pete. Morning, all. Morning, Pete. We're going to dive straight in. And the first story we're going to take is the one I'm going to present, John. And it's got to be Flightline. Um, the world's highest rated horse heading into Saturday's Breeders' Cup Classic, facing the biggest challenge of his life, and people comparing him to the great Secretariat, particularly because he'd won the Pacific uh, Classic by 20 lengths in a manner which was reminiscent of the tremendous machine himself. Uh, we all wanted to see him produce a performance that measured up to that Pacific uh, Classic, or perhaps even uh, looked Secretariat-esque. And I think it's fair to say, if he didn't quite do that, he did a pretty good job winning by uh, more than eight lengths and, 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 and in some pretty spectacular fashion. Indeed, in, the, in, in a race which in the early parts did have uh, a slight uh, reminiscence of, 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 of Sham and Secretariat going for it and streaking clear the, the field and then uh, the, 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 the better horse taking over and forging clear. What did you make of it, John? I, mean, I thought it was absolutely scintillating, wasn't it? And it was, the race was run perfectly for the narrative of we've had the world's highest rated racehorse just cruising alongside. The jockey has a little look to his left and mm. says, I hope he said something along the lines of, see you later. Yeah. And the second he hit go on flight line, he just went, didn't he? It was a remarkable performance. He's beaten some fantastic horses there in the manner of the world's best racehorse, so much so that we're starting to try and compare him to previous world world's best racehorses, um, yes. which is all part of the fun. But it was a, an absolutely remarkable performance. And if you're gonna, if you're a horse called Flightline, ought to be good. And he was unbelievably good. So exciting. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll come to the comparisons with Secretaria in a minute, which is kind of like every great horse being compared to Frankel over here. Um, <laughs> but we have to tackle the fact that he has been immediately retired. Um, just six runs, uh, missed the Triple Crown. And I think it's fair to say that it was only on Saturday that Flightline began to intrude into the American national sporting consciousness. New York Times were writing about him, CNN were talking about him, and he lived up to expectations. So those people who tuned in for the first time to get a glimpse of this wonder horse will have, will have come away hopefully thinking, geez, that was pretty impressive. But then they immediately retired him. Now, I completely understand why the horse has been retired because he's worth you know, perhaps 60, 80, even $100 million now. Uh, and most of that value is tied up in, a, in his worth as a stallion. Um, indeed, even continuing to race, even allowing for the fact there's some big prizes that he could go at, um, would cost a fortune in insurance. So I completely understand why they've taken this decision. But I do think it's only fair to say that we on this, we on this show and elsewhere, we are constantly... Um, criticising organisations that do not put the bigger picture at the, at the top of their priority list. That we we cri criticise uh, self-interest and we criticise short-termism from race courses and racing leadership. And it's hard to, to, to argue, in my view, that this isn't exactly the same. And that by retiring Flightline immediately after just six runs, just when he's emerged as this champion for the sport, that they have done harm to racing and put their own interests first. What do you think, John? I mean, it's, you touched on it there. It's such a big leap from being well-known by the racing public to being well-known by the general public. That is a very difficult gap to cross, and very few horses have done it. So the idea that he was just doing it and then is being put away is, of course, a little bit disappointing because you might have the average viewer sees them on the sports report in the evening and goes, wow. Flight line, what an exciting horse. Oh, I'll never get to see him in the flesh mm. because he's instantly been put away. I think it's a it's a 
head and heart situation, isn't it? I would love for him to have stayed in training and to have tried to kind of get even closer to those great horses of the past and win by 100 lengths next time in, a, in another grade one. But the head says, I, like you say, I can completely understand why they've retired him given how valuable he is. And I yeah. think it's, it's one of those where in abstraction, yes, it, it makes sense to say carry on, carry on, carry on. But if he were my horse, I'd probably lean towards putting him away simply because of the value. But equally, as we sort of discussed before coming on, I don't have a billion pounds in the bank. So yeah. it's a slightly more financial imperative. If there's no financial imperative to retiring him, then I would, uh, I'd lean towards running him. But given the figures involved, I, I can understand why they're protecting yeah. a very valuable asset, or a very impersonal way of saying it. But yeah, uh, you, you cannot argue with the financial case. Pete, let me come to you. Um, you know, US racing is constantly seeking its next superstar, and, and it, it probably needs them even more than racing in, in Britain or Ireland needs them, because in America, uh, horse racing sits quite a long way down the, the, the sort of list of, of, of most popular sports. How do you view this decision to retire Flightline immediately, Pete? Is it, is it completely justifiable? Is it, is it the, the right move? Or, or have they basically uh, put another nail in the coffin of American racing? Well, we kind of project our own feelings onto the situation, don't we? So um, it's entirely understandable, like you say, why they've done it. And really, do they, as owners of a horse, you know, private investors, have a responsibility to, to racing as a whole. I mean, it's not like it's owned by a, an organization as such. They're, you know, if, if we three own the horse, we wouldn't necessarily be thinking, well, it's important that we put the, the wider health of racing first and foremost. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that's got to be considered in the argument of, of um, the good of the sport. Um, the, only, the only sort of aside to that is, and sort of what grates on me slightly is is some of the comments that were made in the run-up and in the immediate aftermath as well. There was the quote about um, racing needing a hero um, and that hero's flight line and that hero's gone. Um, Terry Finley, who was uh, one of the co-owners who, on the ITV coverage, which was taken from NBC, was very sort of um, overcome after the race, looked quite emotional. Um, clearly, it had a, a, a real effect on him, as I think it did with, with everybody in one way or another. Um, in the run-up, he talked about this horse being like a, a rare piece of art, a Picasso or once-in-a-generation kind of horse. Um, and you're kind of thinking, well, you know, they do appreciate some of the aspects of, of it's good for racing, but then say that the, the, the dash to get him off to start, the, the desire to have this unbeaten record. When did this desire to have an unbeaten record become such a thing? Mm. And I think, I think if, you, if you took an outside perspective on this, Pete, and you came at this uh, from the perspective of an NFL fan or a football fan or wh whatever, you would look at the way a champion is crowned, is acclaimed, and then immediately taken off the stage as completely dysfunctional, wouldn't you? It seems um, rather backwards, yeah. yeah. And, and you, know, you look at Flightline's career, as you, as you mentioned, for uh, uh, reasons of injury and... and you know, carelessness he sounds like he's a bit of a clumsy horse um he was unable to run in the triple crown races you know they're classics in america they're the same as the classics over here ideally they're the the best races in which horses prove themselves um you know this horse had two starts in um you know maiden special weight and an allowance claimer boshed through four grade ones in in no style everyone says you're amazing and he's off to cover mares at however much it is a pop i mean we'll find out at some point today what what people value him at because yeah he's being auction in the metaverse isn't it well uh, indeed metaverse being a theme of this show which we'll come back to later um well i mean i think we can we can take a reasonable stab at what he's going to be worth at stud you know i mean assuming it's a six-figure stud fee and, and he mm -hmm. covers 150 mares a year we're looking at north of 20 million dollars per year um you know but how does that compare to what he could earn on the track john well, it's more than he could earn on the track in theory, isn't it? Um, there's no guarantee if he's a fragile horse that he'll sort of train on again mm. and be... There's, it's, it's the unknown that's frustrating us, I sense, is the idea that he could potentially be even better than this, given he's only had six races. Yeah, It's going to be maturing all the time, but with that comes the fragility. And I think Pete raises a fascinating point about this obsession with perfection. And we had it over here with Bailly, didn't we? This mm. idea that 
we have to Being preserve. Being unbeaten is, we have is the be-all and end-all, yeah. Yeah, whereas, you know, is winning, is winning 10 races in a row and retiring more impressive than winning, say, 15 races and losing five, mm. but running at the highest level and taking on all comers? Yeah. It depends what side of the fence you're on. The measure of a true champion is how they pick themselves up the can off the canvas, isn't it? Lovely, yeah. Nice line. Thank you. Uh, I don't think it's mine. Um, well, let's talk about where uh, where he compares. How does he compare to Secretariat? Because that's the comparison that's been made. Well, I mean, we could take it on pure ratings. Uh, 138 RPR. Uh, so that's actually two behind what he recorded in the Pacific Classic. But that in itself um, was one of the highest RPRs ever. It's behind just Frankel, um, who recorded, I think, 143. Um, that's the ratings. Um there's also, I guess, the visual style of the way he won, which was certainly in his last two races, and it, and it did beyond that, was, was, was always stunning. He did have that sort of ability to forge clear. Um, where do you put him in the, in the pantheon, John? I think he's certainly up there. He's up there with uh, the Secretariat, Seabird, uh, sort of Frankel territory. They're, they're, they're what I would call the sort of super horses, and mm. he's certainly knocking on the door. It's fun to compare them, I think, on a broader point, because you quite often, if you took to Twitter afterwards, you hear that I was seeing all sorts of people saying, well, comparison is the thief of joy and just appreciate him and he's a good horse in his own right. And I actually take the view that comparing these horses in no way disparages that the horse that you're trying to size yeah. up. So saying that Flightline might not be quite as good as Secretariat, but is in the same sort of conversation is actually a compliment it's not saying well he's not good enough why can't we just appreciate him for what he is yeah i think he's certainly the the closest that they've come in the u.s in terms of the modern era um but i sense he probably falls a little bit short of secretariat given what he did in the belmont and the fact that he's not running those triple count crown races certainly doesn't help his cause either because i think there is certainly a, a degree of you have to win those, mm. be a triple crown winner to really be up with the big boys. And, but. and can you be a great champion with the best one in the world if you've only raced six times? No, no. I don't, not not of the, because Secretariat raced very early and did it the hard way, yeah. which I think we, we sort of, we like and we, we and even Frankel raced as a two-year-old and did it right the way through, whereas we've sort of got a late bloomer here who at his absolute peak might be in that bracket, but we didn't see the longevity that perhaps secures his place there. Yeah. Pete, last word to you. Where do you put Flightline in uh, the rankings of the greats? I mean, he's undoubtedly a brilliant horse, both the visual impression he leaves and the ratings, like you say. I mean, just to go back to the, the earnings point earlier, I mean, theoretically, if he'd have stayed in training, even uh, one of these sort of late coverings that they do with Stanley's now, he could have gone for the Saudi Cup and the Dubai World Cup and won a big load of money. Um, you know, there were still options for him if they wanted to pursue that angle. I mean, I think the issue with Flightline is is more to do with the fact that it was such a short period of time. And, and really, if you look at the horses that we consider great over here, um, and and indeed to some extent in America, they have been tested. I mean, even over here, you think of a horse like a Naval or, or a Stradivarius or Frankel um, in America, a horse like Zenyatta mm. or Tisnow, who won two Breeders' Cup Classics, or Cigar, of course, that brilliant horse, Cigar. Um, and Bill Mott was quoted in the New York Times in the run-up to um, the, the Breeders' Cup Classic of the weekend, and he talked about what Flightline should do. Really. And he, he was quoted as saying that, that um, greatness is achieved through the test of time, and that's kind of the situation he left in with Flightline. Numbers good, visual impression was good, greatness, he's probably fallen short because he's gone off to stud just as he was on the cusp of really running riot with, with world racing. It's, it's, a, it's a real shame, albeit you entirely understand why they've done it. Yeah, I completely agree, Pete. Well put. It is a shame. It's uh, greatness achieved, but who knows what could have happened uh, had Flightline stayed in training. Um, Pete, we're going to stay with you for the second story. Um, uh, and, and you're following up a fascinating piece you wrote this week um, about a new ownership operation. Uh, it was a story which was equal parts uh, mind-blowing, uh, baffling, and I think it's fair to say worrying. Uh, tell us some more about it. Yes, Omnihorse, um, uh, a different sort of 
story to, to what we've been used to in racing in some respects. Um, in many respects, I suppose. So Omni Horse is a new concept, a new model uh, for racing in some respects that was created um, primarily by Kia Jurabchen, um, the sports agent, football agent, big investor in racing these days, well-known figure. Um, and it links real life racehorses, so the horses that, that he has bought under his ammo racing banner, um, with uh, products called non-fungible tokens or NFTs. These are essentially digital certificates or digital tokens um, that, that um, link the horse um, and the person who buys the token together. Um, and it's, it's all to do with playing out in gaming and it's to do with um, things like the metaverse and with lots of jargon. But in the end, it's, it's uh, a new form of, of people engaging with racing um, through the world of cryptocurrencies and what have you. So in, in the simplest terms, someone who buys a Omni Horse NFT, uh, what are they getting? What connection to the racehorse do they get? Well, the way we described it was like being in a digital fan club, which is probably the best way to do it. It's not, and this was stressed by Jurabjian, um, like buying a share in a syndicate. So um, you have this token, uh, it allows you access to, um, say, uh, like, like a special fan club. In this fan club, you can um, take decisions on um, so non-binding decisions on things like who rides the horse, where they go, things like that. Um, there's also, you can use your token um, in something to, what's the best way to describe it? So you put your token towards um, earning more tokens and these tokens in theory can be traded for something with a tangible value, um, but you don't own the horse. So it's a, it's a connection, but it's not a direct connection. That, that's sort of a lot of where the confusion comes from, I suppose. So I, I, I guess there's, there's obviously been a lot of news over the last year or so about NFTs and uh, sports stars and particularly doing link-ups. We had John Terry, of course, perhaps most infamously of all, uh, launching a range of NFTs. Uh, which have lost about 99% of their value. Um, what's to stop Omni Horse buyers seeing a similar decline? What's the where does the value lie in buying this link with one of the Omni Horse horses? So theoretically, and this is what Omni Horse state, they have a physical asset. So the NFT is linked directly to the value of the horse. Now, the horse is valued by Ammo Racing which is linked with Omni Horse. So whether that's a satisfactory way of valuing horses is open to question. But they, they say that because of, there's a physical asset behind the token, it shouldn't plummet in the same way as these other ones that have been created, like Mr. Terry's. Okay. I, now, this is very complex, and there's lots of things about this, this that aren't fully explained, and they've the, the, the Omni Horse... Uh, organizers kia and others do sort of stress the ability to make money but it does sound a little bit like if i uh do an nft of my car and sell it to you john and mm. say you now have an nft of my car but you don't actually own my car but it has the value of my car um am i missing something no i think that's a fairly accurate the the thing that worries me most is that a horse, yes, is a physical asset, but it's also a, a living being that is campaigned and decision, difficult decisions are made about that horse and where it runs and how it's looked after, importantly, and what happens after racing. And the idea that that horse is linked as almost collateral to an NFT in terms of monetary value slightly worries me because, you know, if that horse dec decreases in value and therefore the NFT decreases in value, are they going to make decisions that try and boost it, that try and change it? And also the idea that ammo racing decide the value of that horse therefore the value of the nft they could they could put any figure on it in theory couldn't they they're, 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 i'm just, i'm struggling I mean, to they, see they whether could. i mean but i guess you can do that with any asset that yeah. the seller can set the price and and, and, and if you determine yeah. it's worth x and people are willing to pay x then then you said it correctly i guess you know that's the fundamental um question here is is are people going to be willing to pay yeah. for what is not quite ownership is not quite something we've seen before, uh, but it's sort of a combination of bits of racing with bits of cryptocurrency and bits of gaming, and it, it, it's, it's 
basically a unique sort of hodgepodge of, of, of things that you're getting access to. And I think it does, you know, this sets the alarm bells going, A, because it's new, and there's a lot of 2022 words in there about cryptocurrency and metaverses and things mm. that aren't proper, yet properly regulated for starters, um, let alone fully imagined. And I think that's the, that would be my immediate gut reaction is it's hard to see where the checks and balances are in here. And while it's okay to say someone will, ultimately an NFT is worth what somebody thinks it's worth or is willing to pay for it. And there's no tangible sort of thing. So I understand how the, having the horse linked to the value is, does provide some assurances, but I'm not sure if it's enough to be asking people to part with their money in a fairly vague way. I mean, yeah. the, the website is a, just jargon city, basically, that I don't fully understand a I lot did, of it. I did, and like, I, on the roadmap on the website, it sort of says what they're doing in 2022, and then for 2023, there's just one word, metaverse. Yeah. Which um, is sort of, you got to think, well, uh, Facebook are, are hemorrhaging billions of dollars a year mm -hmm. trying to build their version of the metaverse, and so, you know, what does that actually mean? What, you know, what are we getting here? It's, it's, it's very vague in that respect. Yeah, this is very vague and you're sort of asking people to get that. I see what they're doing. They're getting a very early market position and we might be, you know, we might have egg on our face in 10 years time. And maybe this is the future of ownership and maybe this is the way that it's going. But I just think that there's too many vague elements to this. Mm -hmm. And I'm a huge fan of ownership and the care of horses being as transparent as possible. So that's that's what worries me most, I think, is the the absence of obvious checks and balances in a way that with syndicates over here, they're, they're very clear about conditions and what you're getting. This feels incredibly vague to me. Uh, it's worth stressing as well, the ambitions for this are absolutely enormous. I mean, Omnihorse uh, officials have spoken about a billion dollar stable um, having thousands of horses. So, so it's a huge, huge project, that, well, at least in terms of the ambitions, Albeit they've already spent um, you know, many, many millions buying horses and, and, and racing them under this new ammo racing omni horse combo. Um, Pete, to come back to you, just thinking about those checks and balances, um, this is obviously completely unique and we have a situation where horses are owned by omni horse but there's a connection to another group of people who, who, who have sort of non-binding votes on, on silks and who rides it and so forth. So, it's quite an opaque ownership situation. Um, have the BHA taken interest in this and have they said anything about their attitude towards Omnihorse? No. <laughs> uh, although I did speak with somebody in, in, in the summer who said, sort of in typical BHA style, uh, we're aware of this. Um, and obviously we, we intend to, to follow it up a bit more in detail this week if we can. Um, the BHA are in a, in a slightly difficult position because... Um, quite explicitly in um, the Omnihorse white paper, which is sort of their um, online uh, technical assessment or, or, or a vision, perhaps, is a better way of putting it for, for anyone who's interested. Um, it talks about how a horse's BHA rating, um, the higher the rating, the more uh, chance it gives you to earn these, these tokens. Uh, and these tokens, say in theory, can be um, traded at some point for um, something more tangible uh, in terms of um you know cryptocurrencies um so obviously <laughs> they might put a handicap in a slightly difficult position if the horse gets dropped seven pounds and all of a sudden someone's uh, uh nft can't make as much uh, money money um as it might have done previously in ter in terms of the checks and balances there are there are other worrying aspects that that need to be looked at i mean omni also done a couple of blogs since we published our article last week uh, in both they've talked about um, investors being able to get a 608% return um, on buying an NFT, sort of based on uh, slightly loose maths uh, and interpretations. Well, this is this um, is based on what they say. Correct me if I'm wrong. The experience of one of their staff. So they do have a basis for claiming this, but obviously suggesting that uh, there's a 608% return possible um, is making a well. It's, a, it's, a, it's an absolutely extraordinary claim, isn't it? It's a, it's a huge amount of money, uh, and they obviously have a disclaimer, sort of disclaimer, saying, oh, this isn't financial advice. Um, but the issue that it, that it creates is that you've got this sort of this FOMO situation, this fear of missing out situation. I mean, who doesn't want to make a 608% return on, on their investment within a year? And 
and you know you, you, yes you want to get in at the ground floor of this because it's going to be the new way we're going to have 2,000 horses in training we're going to be a billion dollar stable that you need to get involved now because mm. in three years time when we've got 2,000 horses and we're worth a billion dollars you know you're not going to be able to afford it you're, you're getting to a position of, of sort of um, you know intensity around this I mean there's this crazy I mean I think it's crazy because I'm not a crypto head but um, on, a, on a social media app called discord they have a group on there and it's it's unfailingly positive it's everything is brilliant we're going to do this we're going to do that it's it's creating a real um atmosphere around that um and it's and it's potentially dangerous if it's not handled properly um so the, you know the bha need to be aware of that and there's a there's a um digital culture media and sport committee on a, nfts being set up in the new year as well um so you know mps are looking at this or will be looking at this because they're aware of the potential for bubbles to be created and for people to get caught out it's it's complicated um it falls in the gap between um you know people are racing knowledge probably aren't going to be hugely involved in crypto and metaverses and web3 and all that sort of stuff and equally people involved in crypto and metaverses and web3 aren't necessarily going to be the, the biggest most discerning of racing fans if, if you understand what i mean so there's a there's a slightly gray area between the two of them and it's complicated and it's you've got to get your head around it but you can't just say oh well we'll just see what happens with this 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 kind of needs to be dealt with and a position needs to be taken on it as soon as possible really because otherwise you know 608 percent return claims are going to lead to people potentially getting stuck in absolutely pete fascinating story and one which i know you're going to be keeping a very close eye on over the coming months um final story of the day john and we're coming to you yeah, so uh, quite a stark shift from cryptocurrencies and metaverses to the mud of the jumps at Haydock. And this, this is the news that just six horses have been entered for the Betfair chase, which is, for all intents and purposes, sort of the first big grade one of the jump season, I would suggest. Um, one of those huge races for the big stain chases, the Gold Cup horses, and for it to only attract six runners is obviously incredibly disappointing. And... I suppose the question that makes this a story is, is why is that? Uh, we've talked about small field sizes on here numerous times. It's not going away. There's various factors that contribute to that. But it's strange to see so few runners in what is a premier race. Dan Skelton, who runs Protector App, one of the sort of leading fancies for that, he put up some potential reasons, and I thought very sensibly. Um, the first, to my mind, is this idea that you can only run top horses in so many races a year. You can only prime them for their big dance, as it were, and those races quite naturally take a lot out of them because they run at a championship pace um, against very good horses, and you're, you're necessarily testing your horses. That's, what, that's the whole point of running them in a grade one. That coupled with the idea that Cheltenham Festival is the be all and end all, the great beast, and whatever word you want to talk about it every year when we talk about whether it's too big or too small, or should it be four or five days, it is the big occasion as far as jump racing goes. And the focus on that was always going to have a knock on effect earlier in the calendar. So if you've got a top horse, say, protector out, and you you think, well, his his big target's going to be the gold cup, he's probably got one more huge race in him. Okay, mm. you might have prep runs somewhere, but. He's only got one big race, you've got to decide which one it is. And that brings me on to sort of the second reason, I think, is these early closing races. So Skelton would have had a look at the book and had a look at the stable tours, no doubt. And, and Henry de Brom had set his stall out very early. We're going to run Aplutar in the Betfair Chase. That's going to happen. You've got a very good horse and protector out. You're looking f weeks out and you've got to commit to we're going to take on this very good horse in likely very testing conditions and it's one of two big races he could feasibly run this year. Do we stick or twist? And that to me explains why so few have decided to stick with that and run in the Betfair chase mm -hmm. uh, because you're essentially having to sign up very early after probably uh, far from ideal prep due to the ground to run against one of the best horses in training on his terms. <laughs> um, yeah with Cheltenham looming large in the distance and owners saying, well, we want to get there in the least or in the most effective, most uh, efficient way possible. It's a bit like the flight line situation in a way, isn't it? You, can, you yeah. can completely understand why the decisions that are being made are made, 
while also simultaneously regretting the fact that the stars of the sport are not seen more frequently when we know they are so important to selling racing, to bringing in new fans and to keeping uh, current fans engaged. Yeah, you're right. And the, it's such a difficult situation. And it's a debate that comes up every year about where Cheltenham sits in the broader calendar. And, mm. and I sort of think we can't have our cake and eat it. We can't sell Cheltenham as it's the this is the absolute pinnacle. This is it. ultimately all that really matters if you've got a top horse is winning these big races at Cheltenham and not expect the other races to suffer as a result. At the same time, Dan Skelton and many others, including myself, are not naive enough to think that Cheltenham isn't the biggest meeting of the year. And it is vitally important if you've got a good horse that you have not only run there, but ultimately that's where everybody wants to win. So it is, it's a bit of a catch-22, but you want to ideally move towards a middle ground where the rest of the races in the calendar are set up in such a way and have the conditions set up in such a way that you can still attract top horses, encourage them to run without then compromising Cheltenham or without being so focused on Cheltenham that you don't bother turning up before Christmas. Yes, yeah, it's the age-old sort of dilemma, isn't it? it? Is Cheltenham too big for racing's own good health? Um, Pete, what's, what's your view on this? Cheltenham, is it, is it a uh, season-defining, brilliant end-of-jumps campaign closer or uh, a behemoth which is damaging the sport? Can it be both? Is that sitting on the fence? <laughs> say, it yeah. is both, isn't it? It is both. You know, everybody wants to win there. You get all the coverage. There's, there's nothing like Cheltenham on, on the flats or over jumps. There, there just isn't. It, we, we shouldn't pretend there isn't otherwise. But, you know, it, it does clearly um, have a huge impact across the, the sport for the rest of the year. You know, there was all the, the issues we've had in the past with Nicky Henderson not wanting to run horses because of the ground and not wanting to bottom horses before they run at Cheltenham and all of that sort of stuff. So, you know, that, that is a challenge. And, you know, does Cheltenham draw people in? Is that why people spend the big money they do at the sales? Is that why they keep investing in the sport because they want to have a, a winner at Cheltenham? Yes. But then I suppose, you know, you've got to have um, trainers and owners who, who take a different approach. You look at someone like Paul Nichols, who's such a dab hand at, at putting his horses in races to, to maximise. You look at what he's done with Greener Teen and, and Froden this week. Mm. You know, he, he seems to have a really good one. I appreciate he's got a lot of horses. But he's a real good way of, of getting the best out of his horses or making them achieve more by taking that Cheltenham is everything approach, saying, right, these are my Cheltenham horses and I'll place my others around to get the best out of them. So perhaps that's something that, that people can consider. I mean, the other thing with a bet fair chase is just, I mean, who's who's sort of really missing from the from the entry? If, if you take away the Irish horses, and it's never been a race where it, there's been a huge amount of Irish interest, is there really a huge amount of horses who you'd expect to be in that race who aren't in the early entries? I mean, that's, that's something to consider. Yeah, no, I think you've got a very fair point there. You know, you're taking on the brilliant Appletard, so you can't expect many horses to turn up this early in the season and potentially take on a challenge which is going to completely colour the rest of the season. Yeah, and, and I think the, the point that perhaps is worthy of debate is about these early closing races and, and making connections almost force their, forcing their hand and saying, you've got to commit to this a long way out as well. You know, if the entries were opened five days before, you might have a few more runners because they'd have a look at it and the horse might have come along mm. a little bit further and they might say, do you know what, we are going to have a crack. We might run for a place. So the, having to commit that early to what is, has historically always been a very unique test against an exceptional horse, I can, it, it makes perfect sense mm. not to run in it. And it's almost a case of maybe we're pushing people into that camp too early. Maybe if it's maybe if it's reopen the entries or we have a position where people are able to come in a little bit later and not pay a huge fee to get in late, they might go, do you know what, we will go for it because we've looked ahead and it, it, this just works, this fits. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I like early closing races as a reporter because it gives us something to get excited about and start generating interest in these contests. But if ultimately you can generate as much interest as you want, but with so few horses it's it's getting harder and harder yeah yeah okay thank you very much john and thank you pete we'll wrap it up there so uh which story is going to go on our front page this week well i think it would be um 
downright depressing, actually, if we put is Cheltenham too dominant on the front page at this stage in the season? Um, so, unfortunately, John, it's not going to be yours. Um, Omni Horse is a fascinating story. It's well worth getting your head around, and I do encourage um, everyone to read that fascinating piece by Pete. Um, I'm sure it will be something we hear a lot more about. But I'm afraid to say it's going to have to be flight line. We can't not put the world's best horse and a horse that has been compared uh, somewhat legitimately to the amazing Secretariat. We simply have to put flight line on the front page. OK, and that's it for this week. Thank you so much for joining us again on the front page. Uh, please do download the new Racing Post app, which you'll find a link to in the description. It gives you incredible access to all our fantastic journalism uh, alongside detailed race cards, exclusive tips, live video and lots more beside. Uh, thanks again for joining us and please do come back again next week when we'll have more news and views from the world of racing.